Father, we indeed, we pray that you would move, continue to lead and guide us. Father, we need to hear from you. So God, would you direct my words? Would you direct our hearts and draw us to you? God, that your truth will reign, that you will guard us from distractions. That, God, you would help us to hear what your spirit is saying and that we will, even as we began singing this this morning, that we will follow you. Even into the the hard, deep waters, the the parts of, of our hearts that we maybe don't want to address, that maybe you're addressing God, I pray that we'll go there this morning so that we are free to follow you. God, thank you for your work. Thank you for our time and your word. What a gift you've given us to open up your word right now and to hear from you. Guide us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you are... Uh, a parent, you've had a child do this. Uh, In this area of anger is what we're going to be addressing uh, this morning out of our study, out of numbers. But as a parent, you've seen your child get angry. And one of the things that happens, particularly for toddlers, uh, is a remarkable phenomena that happens. And I don't know why there's not more science done on it, but they become like jelly. Uh, They lose all bone structure and they on the ground, and you pick them up, and they just dangle there, and they, and then they, you, you let them go, and they just, they're, they're blobs, and they are having a all-out temper tantrum, right? Uh, but then if you try to, to, to guide that and lead that, all of a sudden they get their muscle back, and they flail, and it is, is a nightmare. Uh, if you're not a parent, you've seen it in the store, and you're like, well, my child will never do that. Uh, Just wait. Um, We understand anger. I don't know how you deal with anger. All of us deal with anger to one degree or another. Anger in itself, by the way, is not a sin. What we do with it, it could be. Uh, But, you know, we sometimes maybe as a parent, you kind of feel like, oh, I'm starting. You've had an outburst. And you're like, okay, you kind of work through it. Like, I'm past that now. I'm better until your kid does something else. And why is it that those closest to us can sometimes bring out uh, some of those special tendencies in us? I don't know why that is. But we all deal with it to one degree or another. And so this whole anger thing, you know, when we have these explosions, these outbursts, fury that goes on, when that happens, we, we kind of recover and one of the things that we'll typically feel is not only embarrassment, right? But we're going to feel maybe some shame. We're going to feel some guiltiness. Some of you might be stuffers. So meaning you just take everything in and kind of stuffs. I don't know about you, but maybe that all of a sudden your jar opens up and poof, it all comes out. Others of you are like, just blow the stack. Uh, you're right off. Boom. And there's this, all this anger, out of control rage. Here's my aim this morning. My aim this morning, based on the text that we're going to be studying out of God's word, is that we're going to get a grip on anger before anger gets a grip on you. Because as we're going to see, and if you think about relationships uh, that have been destroyed, oftentimes anger has been an element in that has, that has just ravaged relationships. And we want to guard and protect ourselves. In fact, as we study through the book of Numbers, right, one of the things that we learn, that as we study the Old Testament in particular, that when we learn the lessons and we apply it into our lives, we can protect ourselves from a whole lot of pain. That's wisdom. I want that. So I want us to get a grip on that. And a little, maybe a little secret that we're going to see this morning is there's one leader in particular, that had he gotten a hold of his anger, the devastation, the consequences might not have been as, as bad if he had just gotten a grip on his anger. What we're going to see this morning is one of God's key leaders, in fact, 
had an issue with anger that he never really dealt with. And there was a point along his lifespan when God said, that's enough, and dealt with it. And who is that leader of all people? <laughs> Moses. Moses had a significant anger issue that he never dealt with, and then eventually it had this huge fallout, huge consequences for him. We're going to see that Moses explodes in this uncontrolled fury and, and uh, it, it lands him with uh, deep into sin. I want us to learn from that lesson. Uh, and that's one of the things, right? As we read through and we catch stories out of the Bible, they're not just meant for a story to go, oh, okay, yeah. But rather for us to apply into our lives. There's lessons for us to learn out of that. In our, in our descent now, in our study through the book of Numbers that we've been going through for this summer, we're on our way down and we're going to be finding ourselves in Numbers chapter 20 this morning. Numbers chapter 20. We're at the end of the wilderness wanderings is where we find ourselves. So if you haven't been with us in our study... God's people have been rescued out of slavery. Uh, the Israelites have been sl uh, res rescued out of slavery out of Egypt, where they've spent 400 years of slavery. God has rescued them. He's, raised, uh, he's risen up Moses, who is the leader, and Aaron, his brother. And they have led God's people out of slavery, and they're heading into the promised land. We studied that, and we saw that, hey, they got right to the border of the promised land, sent some spies in to go check out the land and see that God is faithful. He's going to deliver them. And they came back. They're like, no, we can't take the land. There's far too many giants in there. It's not for us. They, they rebel against God and against God's plans. So God says, fine. And they spend 40 years wandering in the desert. Where we find ourselves this morning out of Numbers chapter 20 is right near the end of that wilderness experience. In fact, it's 40 years since they have left Egypt and now they're traveling into this new, uh, this new place. They're right on the border of the promised land of Israel. They're about ready to head into that. And before they do, uh, this older generation is just about completely gone. This new land they're going to be heading into. And what we find is that the people are still prone to the same kind of sins. There's still a whole lot of grumbling and complaining and ranting, as we call that, Right? Things don't always change. People don't always learn from their past. But Numbers chapter 20 is, uh, isn't so much about the repeated sins of the Israelites, but the, the focus, the spotlight is going to land on the particular leaders. The, the focus this morning of Numbers chapter 20 isn't so much on the sins of the people, but rather on the sins of their leader of Moses and Aaron. I'm going to turn to my Bibles to Numbers chapter 20. I encourage you to do that if you haven't done that already. Numbers chapter 20 is where you want to go. I don't hear moving, so you've already done that. You guys are awesome. Uh, and Numbers chapter 20, the very first verse is all about Miriam, who's the sister of Moses, and she dies. But we're going to pick up the story in verse 2, and we're looking from verse 2 through 13 this morning. And what we're going to find is the, the first part here, the first uh, f verses 2 through 5, are these the issue, the problem of the Israelites and the problem that they have. So follow along with me in Numbers chapter 20, verse 2. Now there was no water for the congregation, and all the assembly assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, against God's leaders, Right? And the people quarreled with Moses and said, here's what they said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for, there is, there is it is, no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. So there is this serious grumbling, serious ranting and grumbling and complaining, quarreling that is going on against Moses and Aaron and ultimately against God, as we've seen in the past. 
This, now, all of you, those of you who have read through the Bible and you've been reading through Exodus and things, you're like, wait a minute, didn't I read that already? Well, you saw the same kind of argument some 40 years earlier. If you were to read the first seven verses of chapter 17 of Exodus, you'd see that there was the same kind of argument that God's people earlier did, some 40 years earlier. They, they made this argument of saying, Moses, we don't have any water to drink. We're just dying out here. Why would you bring us out of Egypt so we would die out here in the wilderness? Why don't we just die there? So Moses went to the Lord, and the Lord said, you know what, why don't you go ahead, and I want you to hit the rock. Go to the, the rock of Horeb, bring the people, hit the rock, water is going to come out, I'm going to provide for the people. So that's what happened back in Exodus. Some 40 years later now, the same kind of argument comes up, and that's what we saw, right? There's no water for the congregation. Some 3 million people or so, they don't have enough water. I mean, it's, it's a serious issue. But what comes up isn't just the same issue, kind of like in unresolved issues that are kind of simmering underneath uh, the surface. They bring up on the surface, we're like, oh, they don't have any water. So they're quarreling, they're complaining to Moses and Aaron about they don't have any water. But there's something more going on underneath the surface. So uh, any, some husbands, I'm going to say all husbands, some husbands will get this. Your wife has been telling you about the same thing and mm, not quite, maybe, well, maybe ranting, but keeps bringing up the same thing and you just kind of ignore it. And eventually you do the same annoying thing and she brings that up and then what happens is this, this argument begins. And what you find is that you, in just a few little bits of argument that's going on, you're not you find that you're not arguing about what you thought you were arguing about. You're arguing about the things that weren't dealt with like six months. For, like there's all these issues. You're like, I thought we were talking about this. Oh, no, 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 no. We're talking about all of this. You're like, how did we get there? That's what's going on here. You, you understand that? That's what's happening here. I mean, they're bringing up not just the water issue. But they're bringing up, you brought us out of, the, out, uh, out of the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle. Why have you brought us to this evil place? Like evil place, God led them. I thought we were talking about the water. You brought us to this evil place. You've, you've not provided all these different things. God's been providing for 40 years. Their, their, their shoes haven't worn out. Their clothes haven't worn out. God's been providing for him. God's been doing all kinds. He's, he's constantly providing. They're bringing up all these other issues that are going on. A massive complaint that they bring before Moses, and it's, it's legitimate in a lot of ways. Things aren't going so well, are they? Imagine being a leader of three million people that are bringing all these issues and concerns. How do you deal with that? Well, what do you do when, when issues come to you and you're like, man, what am I going to do? I love what Moses and Aaron do. I love the response of Moses and Aaron so far. Look at verse 6. Look at how they respond. Verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. What do they do? They go to the Lord. Do you see that? All these, this big massive wave of fighting and quarreling, and what do they do? They go to God. They bring it to the Lord. I love that. Oh, if we can learn lessons from that. If we can learn lessons to, when, when the waves of, are coming, that we go to God first. That that's the first place you go to, that you run to the Lord Run to God. Run to the side of your bed and kneel down and pray. That's what we want to do. Fall on your face and go before the Lord. Before you go anywhere else, before you go to Google, and how do I deal with this? Go to God. Before you go to all the social media outlets and you rant, go to God. Before you go to others, go to God. 
go to him. And, and I get it. The people are complaining again. This is, if you've been following, this is not the first time, second time, third time. It's like over and over and over again in numbers. We continue to see that people are grumbling. It's a serious issue. Glad we don't do that, but they did that all the time in, in here. The other thing that I noticed is that they sh- blame shift. Do you notice that the people weren't blaming themselves? They were the ones that were disobedient and rebelled against God about going to the promised land. They're not taking ownership of that. They're like, you brought us here. What's up with that, Moses? Uh, you kind of brought us here. It was your rebellion against God. Blame shifting has been going on a long time. If you ever read Genesis chapter 3, you'll see the fall of man, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I mean, it starts right there, the blame shifting. It wasn't me, it was her. Oh, it wasn't me, it was him. It was, it was the snake. Not my fault, it was the snake. And we see it early on all the way, the rest of the way through the Bible and all the way to today, right? Blame shifting. It's not my fault. It's theirs. They're blame shifting again. But Moses and Aaron, they run to the Lord. They run to God. I love that. If you're in a relationship with another who's a believer and you're, you're finding yourself in conflict, you know what to do? Stop and go to the Lord. Stop and say, you know, can we pray about this? Truth be told, I'm not a big fan in the moment of that. Angela, my wife's usually the one. Like, Can we just pray about this? I'm like, no. Uh, I don't want to stop to pray. Like, everything's in me. Like, that's the last thing I want to do is stop and pray. Uh, every time we do, we, we go, we find ourselves on our faces before the Lord And we pray and we say, Lord, would you move? Would you guide in this? Would you help us to see more clearly? Remove the fog that's going on? Every time we go to the Lord, God moves. God answers. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. God shows up. God moves. Go go to the Lord. You're in conflict. Go to the Lord. Now, now, one of the things that's important, and we're going to see this unpack, unfold here a little bit more. When you go to God to pray, it's really important that when you go to God to pray, that you are submitting yourself to the will of God. Not asking for God to submit to your will. I know we don't actually pray that way. You're like, God, you need to submit to my will. My will is that I'm going to win this. Obviously, we don't pray that way. But sometimes our heart is there. I think we're going to see that here in just a minute. When we go to God to pray, I'm willing to say, God, I need to lay my will down so I can do your will. I'm willing to submit to do what you desire. I'm willing to listen to you in this and to follow. And you know one of the things, too? You don't have to fix everything and let God work. Allow God to to guide. God is really good at what he does. He's been doing it a long time. Trust him. And one of the things I learn is is, is when you pray, is genuine, authentic prayer delights the Lord and he will answer. Trust him. Well, God is going to answer and he's going to give specific instructions to Moses and to Aaron on what to do. See if you can pick up the three things that Moses and Aaron are to do. Look at verses 7 through 9. So they go to God in prayer. God shows up and this is what he says. Verse 7, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse 8, take the staff and assemble the congregation. You and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff before, from before the Lord as he commanded him. So, so far, 
Did you catch there's three very clear instructions that Moses and Aaron are to do? Did you see what they were? Take the staff, assemble the congregation, and speak to the rock to bring forth water. Simple. Everybody got that, right? Not difficult. Oftentimes, God's instructions aren't real difficult. Three things. The scene is set. At this point in our story, the scene is set for a demonstration of God's mercy upon his people. God is about to deliver water to the people. In spite of their sin, God's about ready to deliver. And and what we're going to see is this tragic, sudden shift Moses' first steps are on point. It's the third point that he's going to get off and where the obedience will stop. We can relate to that, can't we? How many times we get started, I'm like, I'm going to follow the Lord, and you start doing so great until, boop, that point. And we go and do our own thing. We'll see that here. In fact, just the last couple of verses, verses 10 through 13, so you get the context. Verse 10, Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me and uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. Serious. Serious consequence, but what went wrong? What, what, what happened here? This third part of the Lord's command is where Moses took over for God and got on his own agenda instead of God's. He, he breaks into a rant of the people. Verse 10, Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water out for you out of this rock? Where did Moses get the idea that he can go ahead and deliver this scathing address? He didn't get it from God. That wasn't anywhere in the instructions. So where did it come from? I believe it came from from Moses' anger. Up underneath, underneath the surface was this anger that came rising up. He's brimming with hostility and he's reacting in unbelief. He takes the staff and he preaches an angry sermon to the people. He has a short fuse and it prompts him to take advantage of an opportunity to level these rebels with this this verbiage that is uh, harsh on the people. In Psalm 106, it's recounting the story of some of the people. In Psalm 106, 32, 33, it talks about Moses. And it says, they angered him, Moses, at the waters of Meribah. And it went ill with Moses on their account. For they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. Notice here in verse 10 and 11, what he says and he does. First of all, he calls them rebels. And then, he, then Moses, verse 11, lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. Calls them rebels, strikes the rock twice. The fact that he called them rebels seems fair enough, doesn't it? Isn't that what they were? I mean, what's the problem? What's the big deal? What's the problem with the fact that, that he's lashing out at them? Here now, you rebels. Here's the problem. 
The problem is, is that he became the judge and jury of the people. And he had no authority to do that. He makes a declaration that the Lord hadn't authorized him to do that. The Lord told him to extend mercy to the people and grace to the people and giving them water that would demonstrate unmistakably that God was the source. And Moses instead sets himself up as the judge. And then notice too, not only did he become the judge, but he set himself up and Aaron up as their deliverers. There's a sense of blasphemy in what he does and what he says. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? We? He's not talking about God. Should we, me, and and Aaron bring water up? I thought this was something that God's supposed to do. But they set themselves up. Then they, he strikes the rock twice as though it's him who is responsible for bringing the water out to the rock. All he's supposed to do is speak to the rock. He takes over. It's God that's supposed to provide the water for the people, not Moses and Aaron. But Moses' unchecked emotions with the people, he acts like everything is up to him. But it wasn't up to Moses. It was up to God to work his power in this. One of the things I love out of here that's almost kind of lost in, in, in the context here is in verse 12 that God still brings water. God still abundantly provided water for the people in spite of his leaders who completely rebel against God. <laughs> that's grace. That's mercy. God's sovereignty isn't thrown off by sin. Good lesson. But Moses has set himself up as the judge and the deliverer of the people. He hasn't trusted the Lord. He's gone off the handle on the people of on the people, and he has acted on Moses' own terms. I think we see the anger of Moses here. The fur- he's furious. The anger rages through his veins. You know the picture I saw? The Incredible Hulk. Right? David Banner, mild, nice, gentleman. All of a sudden, you just, you tip him a little bit. Boop. And what happens? The guy rips his shirt. Everything goes crazy. He goes berserk. Eyes get big. Now, I grew up in the original Hulk. It was awesome. And you would just, he'd get huge, right? And he was But he's super angry. Like, man, this guy has a major anger issue. That was Moses. His tunic starts ripping. Everything's... His eyes get big. Moses is the Hulk. Oh, if only Moses would have dealt with his anger before. Did you know that you see these glimmer, these little glimpses of Moses' anger throughout his, his story. If you were to follow along reading through Exodus, you'll see points when you'll see this anger of Moses, but he never deals with it. Where? Well, if you're reading along in Exodus and you see that Moses discovers who he is, that he's a Hebrew, And he sees an Egyptian who's beating some Hebrews. And it says he looked this way and that way. And he murders the Egyptian and he buries him in a shallow grave. Anger. The last time that he goes before Pharaoh and he leaves Pharaoh's courts, it says that he was hot in anger when he left Pharaoh. And then picture the scene when uh, they they finally get across the Red Sea, they're Mount Sinai, Moses goes up, gets the Ten Commandments for the first time. You remember the people start to worship an idol? 
and he comes down with the Ten Commandments. Think of this. God took those tablets. He formed those tablets. He wrote those Ten Commandments out. Do you think you would hold on to those a little bit tightly? There'd be some preciousness. I mean, I kind of imagine like if I were to be holding the, the original Constitution of the United States of America, I'd be like, ooh, all the more if you're holding the Ten Commandments, the tablets that God formed. When Moses sees the people, what does he do? He crashes them down and they, they break to pieces. And then what does he do? He takes the idols, he crushes them down, he puts them in water, he's like, drink it. He makes them drink the... This guy has a anger issue that's never dealt with. He doesn't deal with his anger. I can understand why he's upset. There's times, but he has unchecked anger. There's times when he's like nitroglycerin. Just tap him a little bit too much. And, and that's what happens here in verses 10 and 11. He explodes. I believe it's Moses' anger that leads him to disobedience of not obeying God. Unchecked anger has a tendency to do that. Moses has this fit of rage and in his sin, notice that he's taken the place as judge and jury over the people. He's not the only one that does this, is he? How many times we become the judge and jury of others? Somebody does something that irritates us, that frustrates us, that makes us upset, and we get more and more angry. We do all kinds, we break things, there's holes in walls, we throw things. Thank goodness that steering wheels are as strong as they are. How many people bang the steering wheel? Oh, I thought it's for an accident. No, it's because of people's anger. We do all kinds of things, but we end up being the judge and jury because somebody didn't meet our expectation. Whether that was said or unsaid, some kind of expectation they didn't meet, and all of a sudden we're the judge and jury, and our gavel falls and our judgment and what do we do? When our gavel falls, we write people off. And what I mean by that is we, we come to the conclusion that they are just absolutely stubborn and they are hopeless. When we write people off as hopeless, that's what that is. We're writing them off. We've judged. We, we, we blow up at people. We get back at them. We retaliate. We give them a piece of our mind. And there's times that we forget all about grace and we become the law. And they're, we, we come to the conclusion that they are guilty as charged. And then to take that and to take it another step deeper. Don't we do that to ourselves? Your continual sin that you keep falling into and you become the judge and jury of your own guilt of sin, like hopeless. I can never get it right. I'll never fix this. And we despair about ourselves and our ongoing struggle with sin. And when we, and when we do that, we act like we're, we are our own deliverers of sin. That self-talk can be brutal. We beat ourselves up and we become the judge and jury of ourselves. As opposed to 
What matters is what the judge thinks, not how we judge ourselves, but how God sees. And sometimes we'll get that twisted. See, if you're in Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have trusted in Christ, you're a Christian, you're a Christ follower. What happens at that moment of belief is that you are declared righteous by God. The judge has spoken because he no longer sees you. He sees you through his son, Jesus, and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. He sees you as a saint. He sees you as a child of God. That's what the judge says. He's already delivered you. He has set you apart as holy. It's his verdict that counts, not your own. He's the gracious judge and faithful deliverer. If you're not in Christ, you're still under the wrath of God. We talked about that just recently. But for those of you who are in Christ, there is hope. For those of you that aren't in Christ, there is hope available for you. For those of you that have never turned to Jesus, there is incredible hope because the judge has given his son, Jesus Christ, for you. So that your sins will be covered over you don't have to judge yourself. You'll be set free. If you're in Christ, you are free indeed. Keep in mind, Moses and Aaron were to follow the Lord's instructions. They were to trust him. They weren't to berate the people. And even though the people were wrong, God hadn't, hadn't given Moses the authority to deal with it. And now Moses and Aaron are the, the rebels. And God speaks, and it's what we saw in verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore, because of that, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. If you read further along, the death of Aaron is, is in this chapter. Moses doesn't make it into the promised land. Serious consequences. In fact, if you're reading through Deuteronomy, three different times Moses will plead with God that he can get to the promised land. And there's a point when God says, that's enough. My answer is no. The consequences were serious. The best counsel that I can give, better than any psychologist, on anger is found in James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Put it up here on the screens. Let every person be quick to hear slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let every person be quick to hear. Listen quickly. Listen, listen. I'm going to listen. I'm, I'm not going to come to conclusions yet. I want to listen. I want to understand. Listen to understand. I want to be slow to speak. I want to speak in such a way that I'm understood. I'm going to be slow to get angry because I want to understand. Let's, let's, let's meet on this. Let's, let's put our heads together here. Let's figure this out. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Moses never learned that lesson. 
Instead, his destructive monster inside consumed him. Moses needed to tame his tongue. Instead, he becomes out of control. If only he would have dealt with it before. It's an important lesson for us from this account and what God says. One of the lessons is an act of disobedience stems from unbelief. Let me repeat that. An act of disobedience stems from unbelief. God said there in verse 12, you did not believe in me. You didn't believe in me. When you know God's will and you willfully move in another direction that is unbelief, plain and simple. You're saying when you know what to do and you don't do it, you're saying in essence, God, Lord, I don't believe your plan is best. I think I know better. I'm going to do what I think is best. Because you did not believe in me. My plan is better than yours, God. I'll strike the rock. And in so doing, Moses demonstrated that he really, what he really believed in all this, that God didn't know what was best to how to handle the people. And how many times in our own lives we clench our teeth and then stubbornly do as we think we want to do. That's unbelief and it's disobedience. Two sides of the same coin. We also learn here from what God says in response is that our sin diminishes God's glory. God says, you did not uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people. In other words, Moses, you have tainted my holiness. You have encouraged these people to forget that I am a holy God. I think this is a a wonderful reminder for us. This is a great reminder that as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a Christian, you are being watched. Your kids are watching you, parent. Your employers are watching you. Your boss is watching, the workers around you are watching, your friends are watching, your neighbors are watching you. Trust me, they're watching what you do. They're watching how you respond. They're watching what you post. They're watching what you say. They're watching how you deal with the trouble that comes your way. People are watching. They're watching to see if what you say is legit for you. As Christians, we want to make much of Jesus. We want to show that God is supreme in our lives. We want to show that he is the one that satisfies. We're not going to do that perfectly. But ultimately, you're being watched. And it becomes evident what's most important to you. 
Let me close with addressing specifically this issue of anger. I think that's what this text brings out. Let's address that for just a moment. In fact, maybe close your Bibles for a moment. I want you to think. Do you find yourself surging in anger far too often? Here's an indicator. Is there times when you find that it, it scared you or that it scared somebody else? Don't just let it go on and hope that it's going to get better. Don't just hope that anger will just go away if that's something that's been an issue in your life. As we've seen out of Numbers 20, the consequences can be exceedingly more than you can imagine. You know how many marriages I've seen destroyed? How many relationships between either the child and the parent because of the child's anger or the parent's anger against the child and those relationships that have been destroyed because of that, that, that anger that runs through the veins Friends and the relationships that have been destroyed. If, if that describes you, deal with it. Get help. And, and let me state the obvious, what I think is the obvious. You won't find your help through the right breathing technique. You're not going to find your help through, uh, through yoga. You're not going to find your help through just transcendental meditation. Mental meditation. You won't find the answer through just thinking good thoughts and just bring yourself to a good place. Think good thoughts. Your answer to your issue of anger will be found at the foot of the cross. I can't make that any clearer. I can't give you any more hope than the fact that you will find your answer to anger that you are struggling with at the foot of the cross. Let God in. Let him address that issue. And as you go to him first and foremost, you run to him. The first thing you do is you run to him. And as you do, let him start bringing people or a counselor, getting biblical counseling to help deal with that before it destroys the relationships around you and what matters. Get help. Don't just hope it goes away. Don't just Google, how do I deal with anger? Let Christ, let the Spirit of God be the one to strengthen you and help you. Begin by coming to the cross. Come before the Lord. That's the hope. That's the hope. Let's pray. God, we have the hope the answer is in Christ, the power of the Spirit of God. God, we have hope today. God, we get to look at this hard issue and we get to bring it to you and say, God, this, this sin that can so easily destroy God, would you intercede? Would you work? Would you move? By your spirit, would you minister? 
Would you heal what's been broken? God, I pray that this would be a congregation that if there are broken relationships because of this issue, that God, there would be some mending that takes place today. Phone calls that are made. Conversations that will happen. Healing that will begin to take place. God, people that would have the courage to deal with this heart issue. And not just avoid it and hoping that things get better. Minister, as only you know how, God. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for giving us your son. Thank you for what you are doing and will do and have done. In Jesus, great and powerful and almighty name, we pray. Amen.